So um, a good afternoon and a good evening to all of you, um, wherever you are. And you are all warmly welcome to the Shannon Lecture Series, the spring edition for 2022, the series that we've titled The Management of Natural Resources and the Environment in Canada, the Historical and Transnational Perspectives. And so once again, you are all warmly welcome. I am Stephen Osei Owusu, a PhD candidate and a graduate research assistant at the Department of History, Carlton University. And I am the host for this series. And I must as well add that I am a very keen enthusiast of the environment. Uh, before we proceed, let me first uh, say some thank yous to some people and uh, organizations, offices that have been very instrumental in the organization of this particular series. Um, and I must also admit, or rather say that this presentation that is coming to you from both the University of Cape Coast, where I am currently located in Ghana, and then the University, the Carlton University um, in Ottawa, Canada, also acknowledges that the location of Carlton University and the location of the University of Cape Coast um, is an unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation and an unceded territory of the Free People, respectively. And that's, uh, it is through their auspices that we are currently coming your way live with this particular presentation. Um, I would also proceed by saying a few thanks to some of our sponsoring units who have been so instrumental in the organization of this particular series. And in no particular order, I would want to acknowledge the contributions of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. I would also want to acknowledge the School of Indigenous and Canadian Studies, the Institute of Political Economy, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, the Institute of Environmental and Interdisciplinary Science, and last but certainly not the least, the Institute of African Studies. Um, I must also mention that we are deeply indebted to the role that the Department of History Culture University has played. The department is chaired by Professor James Milner, who happens to be uh, one of the, the participants you know, out there. Professor Miller and the Department of History Council, we are indeed grateful for your support. This afternoon, we are honored to be hosting one academic who is very much interested in researching into marine life, uh, specifically, I mean, fisheries. And he is none other than Professor Joseph Agrifen who is a lecturer at the uh, University of Cape Coast, incidentally, where I also happen to teach. Professor Joseph Agrifin is an associate professor of fisheries and aquatic sciences in the University of Cape Coast. He has developed his career in Ghana and Germany and has experience in the research and teaching of fisheries and aquatic sciences since 2002. His research interests cover the following areas marine microplastics in fish stomach contents, fish stock assessment in the Western Gulf of Guinea, otolithic studies of marine fish species, marine capture fisheries and offshore oil and gas operations, environmental monitoring in the offshore oil and gas fields in Ghana, and occurrence of heavy metals in fish visceral organs in small scale miners. Professor Agrifin had participated in a number of multinational offshore cruises for oceanographic and fisheries data collection and research in the Western Gulf of Guinea. As a scientist in 20, 2005, 2009, 2010, and 2012, respectively, he was the founding director of the Institute for Oil and Gas Studies in the University of Cape Coast from 2013 to 2018, and has served as a member on the National Steering Implementation Committees on National Fisheries College between 2011 and 2019. And he's also um, a member of the West Africa Regional Fisheries Program, that is WAF FP, between 2012 and then 2016. And so this is the 
um, academic in our midst that this afternoon he's going to share his presentation with us, his research findings on fisheries with us. Um, I would also go ahead and then specify the order of the day. Professor Joseph Agrippin, respectfully, you have 25 to 30 minutes to do your presentation. And after that, we'll have roughly about 20 minutes for um, question time to engage you. And for all of us that are attending this particular talk, um, I would also mention that you could engage Professor Agrippin with your questions through the chat box feature, um, where I would read these questions and then feed them to Professor Agrippin. And so you don't have to worry having to check the chat box for all entries. And so without much ado, Professor Joseph Agrafin, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Stephen, so check, what am I? Okay, the slide is shown, right? Hello, Stephen. Yeah, hello, Paul. Right, so the, yeah, so the, you can the, see the slide, the first slide, right? No, it is not showing there. You have, you'd have to share your screen, I believe. Oh, again? Okay, then let me share it again, sorry. You see it now, please. Yes, it is. It is All right. not sure. Good. So, well, so I can start. Thank you very much. Sorry for that delay. Yeah. So once again, good afternoon. And as he said, I'm Joseph. I prefer to be called Joseph. And uh, it's about the small scale fisheries in Ghana, the historical and transnational perspective. So the talk will follow this outline. I'll give the overview of small scale fisheries in Ghana. Thereafter, it will be referred to as SSF. Then the structure of marine fisheries in Ghana, because when you talk of small scale fisheries, the marine sector provides the greater part of the fish production in the small scale fishery. Again, the SSF contribution in the Ghanaian economy as a whole, I'll give an overview. Then uh, characteristics of our small scale fisheries, in terms of the fishing gears used in the SSF and also the fishery resources that are exploited by the SSF. I'll briefly talk about that. Then I delve into historical perspective of our SSF, that is small scale fisheries in Ghana, and then the transnational or the migrant fishers in the SSF in Ghana. So we can start. Anyway, so just to show where Ghana is hiding on the globe, for those of us who are not so conversant with the uh, location of Ghana. So if I am right, Canada is here, somewhere here, and uh, across the Atlantic to the west coast of Africa, that is where Ghana is located. And then the neighbors of Ghana in the West African coast is La Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Burkina Faso, La Côte d'Ivoire in the west, Burkina Faso in the north, Togo, Togoland in the east coast, and then the south coast is the Gulf of Guinea, which is also part of the Atlantic Ocean. That is in brief. We have a coastline which stretches about 550 kilometers. And there are notable uh, fishing communities, Axim, Sekendi, Elmina, Winneba, Accra, and Tema, and also Keta. That's not showing you. When you talk of small scale fisheries in Ghana, we have it in the offshore marine. We also have it in the inshore marine. And then we have it inland. When we talk of inland, we are talking about the freshwater system, the lakes and the rivers, and also the aquaculture. In our aquaculture sector, it's mainly small scale. It is not on the industrial scale as we find in the developed world. And uh, with all these areas that has the 
small scale fishery or the small scale fishes, uh, fishers operate. We have the fish processors because the fish that is caught are processed. We have the traders that deal with the fish that is produced or catch. And we have other auxiliary fish workers, like those who cut the fish to the market, the carpenters that carve or the weaver that carve the, the fishing gears and the boats and so on and so forth. They are all part of the other fish workers. So it's a large group. Now let's zoom to the marine fishery sector. As I said, the marine fishery sector contributes greater amount of fish in our part of the world. So we take the fisheries as a whole in Ghana, we have two main levels, the subsistence level and also the commercial level. The subsistence level, they are the fishermen or the fishers that fish only to feed their family, not on commercial purposes. So in case they are even selling it, they only sell part of their catch to buy ingredients to uh, prepare the fish for their own consumption. And we have other fishers that fish on commercial basis. We have that, uh, the components of the commercial fisheries are three, the artisanal, which is tradi purely traditional, the semi-industrial and also the industrial. Uh, this categorization comes in as a result of the complexity or the the technique, the techniques in the fishing that uh, they operate. So as we move on, I will throw more light on the artisanal and the semi-industrial and industrial. All right. So just to show you some pictures, these are all fishing canoes and gears that are operating in our small scale fishery. So the first picture on my left is showing small scale fishes on fish expedition on the high seas. Below that, we have a one man fisherman casting net in a coastal lagoon in Ghana. We also have a landing site in Elmina. Elmina is very close to Cape Coast, in of Cape Coast where I am located at the moment. It is a natural fishing harbor that harbors the canoes and then the semi-industrial boats. It's called the Elmina. I would say a little bit about Elmina as we move on. And then we also have these two canoes on the heights. I captured this uh, picture way back 2005 on my uh, fishing expedition with industrial or the research vessel. I came across these fishermen. They are actually Ghanaians, but we, these waters you see, they are not Ghanaian water, but way back in uh, Morovia, that is off Liberia. And they were speaking my native language. So that is where I got the, to know that uh, Ghanaians are all over in the west coast of uh, Africa fishing. Again, concerning Elimina and other fishing communities in Ghana, they see small scale fishery as a tradition and also a culture. Why tradition? Because even though it is commercial, they are doing it for business, but fishing is part of their everyday life. They are singing, they are practices, they are traditional beliefs all centered around fishing. So we will talk more on that as we move on. Again, the contribution of small scale fishing in Ghana. Let's see how important it is. Ghana population, when it used to be 2.5 million, uh, that is 25 million people way back 2015. It was estimated that 10% of the population is involved in fish, either direct or indirect. That is what I talk about, the processors, the catchers, and then those who are marketing and so on. So they are part of the fishery. Now our population is about 30 million recent census that it is. And therefore, 10% of that will even be more than the 2.5 million that we are talking about here. Again, the small scale fishery contribution in the marine fishery sector it's roughly about 70%, which means it is an important fishery subsector that we don't have to overlook. Looking at the people involved and then the amount of fish that they contribute. Again, Ghana is a fish eating country. So we take our source of protein from mostly fish and about 50 to 
percent of protein intake are from fish, uh, or most Ghanaians. On the average, too, per capita consumption is 25 kg per annum. This is the report from World Bank. Now let's look at the characteristics of small scale fisheries in Ghana. It is characterized by the use of several gears and that makes the fishery a little complicated. So the fishing gears that are involved in the small scale fish are the pair seine nets, the B seine nets, set nets, drift nets, cast nets, hook and line and traps. Again, <laughs> the small scale fishery practice in Ghana, it is an open access fishery. When you say open access fishery, it means that you don't need a formal license to go into fish in the marine fishery sector. It is not so for semi-industrial, it is not so for industrial. That way you need a license from a government, recognized government institution before you can set out to fish. But then with the, semi, uh, with the SSF, small scale fishery in Ghana, you need just the traditional authorities certification and it differs from landing site to landing site. And therefore, we normally refer to as the open access fishery. Again, the gears used for the small scale fisheries are mainly the dugout canoes in Ghana. As of 2016, the canoe frame survey that was done by the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture in Ghana put the total number of canoes to be around 11,500. They are operating in a various landing site, which is about 478 fishing villages and landing sites. I must say that we do canoe frame survey every 10 years. And recent reports that are not published, we know that the canoe numbers are gone up to about 13,000 and over. Therefore, people tend to say that we are operating over capacity in our waters. Again, canoes from the time immemorial has been powered by sail or oars or paddles. In recent years, when I say recent years, in the 50s that we introduced the outboard motor that uh, requires some uh, gasoline to push it to further waters. Again, because they use oars and also paddles and they don't have good preservative system like the freezers and so on, or cooling systems on board, they normally operate daily trips. They go catch the fish fresh and they land them for marketing. A few of them, like the hook and line canoes, they will have improvised boxes or freezers on board. So they go along with uh, ice cubes, which are very hard to stay for days. Of course, it's well protected, covered. And so as they fish, they put this ice on it so they could stay for up to five days before they come back. Again, each of these gears I've mentioned, they have specific targets. So if you, that is the fish resource that they target. So if you take the person, they normally target the small pelagic species. I'll show you some pictures, few pictures as we move on. Again, the hook and line also target the demersal fish species like the red fishes and so on and so forth, which are living in the rocks or along the continental slope. The B seine targets mostly juvenile because they op operate on the seashore. And as they pull, they only get the juvenile fishes that are actually trying to mature and go back to replenish the stocks in the sea. So a lot of people have raised concern about the sustainability of B seine fisheries. Drifting gill net also target the tunas. These are the large uh, pelagics and the bill fishes. The set net targets the lobsters, the crabs, and then the octopus. There are other benthic organisms that it can also trap. So to show you a few uh, pelagic fishes that we have of commercial importance, we have the tunas, the skipjack, the yellowfin, and then the big guy. There are other, I think we have about five species also in our waters, just to show you a few. We also have the sardinellus. This is the flat sardine. We have the eight round sardine also in our water. This is the season for that. Around May, June, July, August, because the upwelling, the water is shining out. The, our waters are so productive and the sardines produce in large numbers. And that is the time that fishing business is good for our small scale fisheries. We also have the mackerel, like the scumba coleus. 
we have the anchovy. This is a typical anchovy we have in our water uh, called Engraulis and crassiculus. There are a few or some uh, demesas that I want to, they are high price demesas. We have the, the dentist species, we have the snappers, we have the cassava fish, the soul fish, the soul fish, the flat fish, and some cephalopods, and then the crustaceans. We have the, the lobster, the shrimp, and then the octopus, and also the squid. They are very common in our waters, and they are all targets of small scale fisheries. Now let's look at the historical perspective of SSF in Ghana. In fact, it has been reported that before 1800, the canoe, the use of canoe has been reported that before 1800 by Kojosu 2009 and others. In fact, the fishing techniques that are used in the small scale fishery have been developed over centuries. I'll give you a few examples. The netting materials that they used during that time, they were from cotton and hem. Again, the hooks for the hook and line were made from stones and also carved wood. And then in modern times, because of modernity and technology has improved, now the netting material, they are using what you call a synthetic fiber. But before then, they were also having nets for fishing and other fishing gear. The hook and line, or the hook and line, now they have changed the hook to metal and other materials that are uh, modern. Again, naming of fishes is very interesting. It has some traditional roots. Of course, we have the systematic scientific names for our fish or English names for fishes that we have in our water. But the fishermen also have their own traditional name. And this is an area that probably we can explore further. Not much has been done. How do they name the fish? But my little research that I've done with them, it shows that the names that they give to the fish end up describing the nature of the fish, how the fish looks and how the fish smells and how the fish uh, is designed. And so it's, a, it's an area that we can really explore. And how did they get to know about this name? I learned that mostly the, these are traditional uh, names that are passed on or training that are passed on to generation after generation. So it's very interesting. As I said, we have to uh, move further. Again, as I said, the small scale fishery or the artisanal fishery is very simple. They use simple implements or gears. They are low efficient and then the methods are very traditional. But in modern times, we realize that outboard motor and other techniques have been introduced and therefore it has just increased their catch and therefore also empower them to go to areas that they used not to go to fish. Now, the continuation of the historical perspective, we are going to look at the traditions and taboos that have some historic roots. We still practice these traditions and taboos in our small scale fishery. But if you look back as a scientist, it's clear that these traditions were made to conserve the fish stocks. So for instance, one, we have no fishing day. Along the coast of Ghana, every fishing community, they have a particular day they don't fish. And if you dare fish, the traditional laws will deal with you. And you could see that this was instituted to help save the stocks. So my part of the city, Cape Coast and Elmina, which is a, a fishing community or fishing area, they don't fish on Tuesdays. Other places, it is Wednesdays. Other places, it is Thursdays and so on and so forth. Again, fishing festivals. I told you from the beginning that fishing is a tradition. Fishing is a culture. So Elmina, for instance, and Accra, Jamestown, for instance, they have festivals that have been designed to surround the fishing activity. Elmina, we have something called Bakitwe. Every July, they celebrate this. And they ban fishing in the lagoon for one whole month. You don't have to fish, you don't have to do certain uh, things so that the idea is to, uh, what do you call it, replenish the stock. So at the climax of this festival, the chief priest will come and fish and the quantity of fish that they get uh, signifies the bumper harvest that particular year they will have. Accra too, they have Ogan people, the tribe called Gan, 
They also have a festival known as Homoho. It's also centered around fishing. So it is very important that uh, we preserve uh, the traditional beliefs of our small scale fishing community because it helps to conserve the fish. Funeral rites for certain marine species, for example, whales. This is also done in most of the fishing communities. Anytime a whale or a marine mama assures due to whichever reason, they perform funeral rites or certain traditional rites for the animal. The reason being that they see these huge marine mammals as gods that are in the sea. And there are mythical stories or historical uh, ideas about these animals that some went to the fishing, they got lost, and then the animals saved them. So they believe in that. And um, uh, there are some rites that they normally perform uh, as they see these animals. We also have certain sacred groups or mango forests along the coastal lagoons and estuaries. These groups are sacred. You are not supposed to go in there to do anything. That is in the, age, in the olden days. Now people manage to go in without authorization, but formally, if you go into these groups, there are sanctions, traditional sanctions that you go to. Why so? Because most of the marine fish species, they spawn in the coastal waters. The juveniles end up in these lagoons and they serve as nursery grounds or protected areas for these small, small fish. So when they grow up to a point, they go back to replenish their stock. So it was for that wisdom that the coastal communities, they preserve these mangrove groves as sacred areas. Again, custom on fish sharing. Traditionally, we have a system of sharing the fish. That is, if you take one canoe and one fishing expedition, we have about 10 to 15 or 20 people on board. Each person on board has its specific role that they play. And based on your role, when they come back from fishing expedition, they share fish according to your role and also according to your contribution. And that has persisted. And we still have, and we still practice that. It is very historic. Again, fish processing. Oh, if you read textbooks, if you read uh, literature, we have been preserving fish with salt, sun dry and smoke for so long a time, for so many years, before freezers and uh, cooling system came into being. And we still practice them. So it is an Asian fish processing technique that we still use. Uh, I just returned from Senegal just yesterday. And when I went there, it was marvelous. I saw Ghanaian community that they are involved in the sorting of these fish and then they send it to Ghana. And it has been there for years. I'll talk a little bit as we move on. Again, folklore songs. When fishermen are fishing, they sing. If you don't know, you will think that they are just having fun. No, it gives them morale and they sing about their life. They sing about their catch. And then as they sing, they, they pull the net, and this has been a traditional practice for ages. Again, more work needs to be done because we need to understand the origin of these songs and how it helped them to do their work as a small scale fisher. Installation of chief fisherman. In fact, every fishing community has a chief fisherman, but we have different types of chief fishermen. Some communities, the chief fisherman is the actual chief of the town or the fishing community. Other places, the chief fisherman is selected from eminent fishermen in that community. And it's a well-respected person that when he sanctions anybody for infringement, it is respected. They are very well respected. And mostly it's a man, that is why it's called chief fisherman. Again, there are women that lead the fish processing and fish marketing. In our language, we call it Konkohima, the Konkohima, they are leaders of fish processors and fish mongers. In fact, they control the commerce of fisheries in Ghana when it comes to small scale fisheries, right? So the lines of development in fishing techniques, I've talked about some of them, but when it comes to mechanization of fish, they used to uh, use hoes or hand driven out there are gasoline that operate. When it comes to size of the hook and line, it used to be just single hook from a metal or wood, which is carved. Now we have long kilometers of lines with numerous hooks. 
All these things also has to have some implications on uh, sustainability of our fisheries in the small scale fish. So maybe during the discussion, we can talk a little about that. Again, transportation of the fish that is landed, it used to be carried on the head and also using horses. In fact, Ghana, we have, used, we have stopped using horses, but in Senegal, I saw horses at the landing site carrying or cutting fish. I said, wow, these people have maintained the old age tradition, which means some of the traditions have been preserved in some countries and also in some landing sites. But Ghana now, we use tricycle, truck, and other developers. I'm sure they will use aircraft and so on and so forth. Detecting devices, they still use their eyes and experience to detect, even though some have gone ahead in Ghana to acquire handheld echo sounders and some uh, high level technical gadgets to fish. Now, let's look at the transnational perspective of small scale fish in Ghana. As I said, there are records that 1800s and early 1900s, Ghanaian artisanal fishers or small scale fishers went as far as Liberia and Nigeria. And I've showed a canoe that I, he captured them in Moravian water in 2005. And again, at present, we know that there are Ghanaian fishing communities, normally they call them fancy towns, dotted around uh, from Angola up to Senegal, along the west coast of Africa. And uh, mostly they are settlers and also migrants. The people I met just last Wednesday in Senegal <laughs> landing site, I interacted because they were speaking my native language and uh, I interacted with them, Fanti. And uh, I asked them, when did you, he said their great grandfathers migrated to Senegal. And I asked them, do you come home? They said, yeah, they come home occasionally. Even one testified that just last week, he came from Ghana. And these guys have maintained their tradition from Ghana. They speak our Ghana language. They still understand the Senegalese language and also the French. Again, distribution of fish. So I asked, I went further to also ask these Ghanaians who are in Senegal that they used to have sorted cartilaginous fish that they uh, sent to Ghana for marketing. They so they still do it. And interesting, there's a community we can follow in central region called Mankesim. Mankesim, that is the center of these cartilaginous fishes that are sorted. We normally call it cacao. It is a delicacy in Ghana and other West African countries. So once these cacao or these sorted fish are sent to Mankesim from uh, Gambia, from Senegal, from other places, they are sent to Mankesim and then people come and buy them and send them to the interland like Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, and so on and that West African neighbors. Again, these migrant fishes occasionally return to Ghana, normally for funerals and also for festive seasons. So this is the picture this Wednesday uh, I took with the Ghana fishermen in uh, Senegal. The fishing community is called Umbo, Umbo Senegal. And uh, these are Ghanaians, they were speaking Fanti. And interestingly, even their, gan uh, their canoe they use, the inscription on it is called Nanabusia. Nana Busia. Busia is in Ghana, in the Western region. So they told me that they are actually from Shama. They're in the Western region of Ghana. And it was so interesting. Probably in future, we can follow these people from Angola to Senegal and even Mauritania to see exactly what they are doing and how they ended up there. It is a very useful historic information. Now, Ghana fisheries or small scale fisheries is not without issues. They have uh, recent past gone through some declining fish stocks. Uh, I won't go too further to explain, but maybe during the discussion, if it comes up, I can throw more light on them. Also, plastic pollution is a challenge in our small scale fishery. There are livelihood issues. Uh, there are fuel and other fishing input subsidies that government gives now. It is dwindling and it has become a big challenge. There are gender issues. Uh, migration is a problem. Human rights, conflict, co-management of the fishery resources. Uh, how the traditional beliefs or traditional governance system and also the uh, national laws that control the fishery can be made so that we can use that to uh, exploit our stock sustainably or govern our stocks sustainably. Safety is also a challenge in recent times. 
I'm done. Sorry, though. sorry, bro. Yeah, you have just about uh, three more minutes. Yeah, so I'm there. done. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Joseph Adrian for that wonderful lecture. Uh, it seems there are some. So we are now at the question time, and and like I mentioned initially, if you have any questions to engage the presenter, kindly slot these into the chat box, and I'll read them to him. I could see some two questions already in there. Thank you, Professor, for the, the rather interesting uh, talk that you've just given us. And so I would read to you some of these questions and then you can address them. This is from Professor Ronald Rudin. He's asking, it's an interesting lecture. Could Professor Griffin talk about challenges faced by the small scale fishery? In Canada, such fish, fishers have been unable to compete with large industrial fishing by trawlers and have suffered uh, decline. Sorry, Good. So decline of certain ahead? species. Sorry, bro. Um, oh, they ahead. have started, suffered decline of certain species due to overfishing. Could he discuss whether there are such environmental challenges being faced by small scale fisheries in Ghana? Right. Thank you. So, can I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Very good. Go so, uh, Stephen, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so it's a very uh, important question you asked. We also have the same problem. In fact, the small scale fishery, more or less, there's a seemingly conflict between the canoe fishery and also the industrial fishery. Day in and day out, we hear some uh, crash even on the high seas and also on land. What happened is that when the small scale fisheries set their nets, waiting to be harvested, this industrial fishery, they run into them. And you know, net or the, the gears are very expensive. And so from time to time, they have this crash again. The small, uh, what you call the small scale fish or the canoe fish, they always complain that in the night, these industrial trawlers, they are not supposed to trawl uh, at a 30 meter contour, very close to the coast. But in the night, they do what you call poaching. They come to where these small scale fishes are supposed to fish. And then, you know, trawlers, they are powerful uh, machines. So they trawl and clear most of the uh, small pelagies that, uh, that should be available for the canoe fishery. So day in and day out, there are conflicts. But the ministry has managed to uh, contain these conflicts, but you never know. And again, uh, from these practices, it is actually affecting the amount of fish that the small scale fisher, that the canoe fishermen are supposed to get. So there, yeah, we also have similar problems. And recently, there has been a problem with the oil industry. We have put uh, offshore offshore installations for the petrochemical industry. And interesting, where these oil are being drilled, uh, some of these areas are productive areas for our small pelagics. And therefore, the areas are protected and the small scale fishermen are not able to go there. So it's a big challenge, actually, it's a big challenge. All right, so that is it. Okay. Yes, um, thank you, Professor Agrippin. Um, I have... A question for you in the absence of other questions slotted into the chat box. I'm sure as we engage, there, there would be some that subsequently will pop up. Um, the question is, um, how many scholars, you know, like you study this sector and these questions uh, in Ghana and in neighboring countries? What remains to be done most in this particular area that you are engaged in researching? I don't know if you could provide some perspectives on that. Very good. Anyway, so. There are a few fishery professors in Ghana. They, you can count them on your hand. Uh, probably because it is not a lucrative area, so uh, people don't want to go into that. But then, I must say it's a very important area. There are issues in our fisheries. For instance, this historic perspective is something that we need to follow to understand the social cultural dynamics of our small scale fishery. I wouldn't say the entire fishery, because entire fishery, you are bringing in the industrial and the same industrial. But small scale fishery, because I told you that they contribute 70% of our marine fish production. So they are very important uh, group in our economy. And for them to move historically along the coast of West Africa, 
there might be something interesting, but let me just tell you the preliminary idea I have with this migration or transnational migration. You see, Gulf of Guinea is, uh, the production in the Gulf of Guinea is controlled by Guinea current. Up to Senegal, Quebec, it is controlled by Canary current. Up to Angola, it is controlled by Benguela current. The Canary and the Benguela current are most productive as compared to Gulf of Guinea. So I'm not surprised that in the olden days, our forefathers moved to these areas to do fishing because over there, the fish production is very, very, very high. All right. Okay, Prof. Um, so just a follow up to that. Um, There's a personal question. I, I want to find your, your own personal thoughts on this. Would you say within the current, the context of the 21st century and, 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 and the political dynamics, would you say that states, particularly African states uh, and nation states in that regard are losing their, their power of regulation, regulating you know, the environment, uh, especially in the face of neoliberal private capital. Um, I am asking this question, particularly in reference to a practice that I know uh, is very endemic in the fishing industry in Ghana. They call it cycle. Yeah. Um, and I think it's associated with pair trolling by the big, big industrial you know, fishing trawlers yeah. um, who go out to fish and then in the process of fishing, they harvest some, 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 some fish, you know, little pieces of fish that are not matured enough to be brought to the market. But these are subsequently harvested, you know, wholesale and then uh, offloaded to other smaller vessels or smaller boats. And these are brought, you know, back to shore and are smoked and are brought to the market to be sold. Essentially, you know, Stimulating the process of depleting the the the, the 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 you know the finger lanes that are out there in the oceans, and so I was wondering, and this practice has been very endemic for you know some years now, and it appears that many African governments, particularly the Ghanaian government, as I'm aware, is finding it difficult to regulate this particular sector when it comes to it large industrial you know fishing activities. Uh, would you say states are losing that 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 you know? Ability to control and 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 regulate the environment, particularly the marine environment. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah. So, um, I wouldn't say yes. We have lost our ability to control the environment, but with the cycle, yes, it is illegal. In fact, it is a transshipment, which is not allowed in our law, uh, like fishery law books. We don't allow transshipment. But interesting, this was, into, it has historic perspective. Uh, they used to throw these bycatches, we call them bycatches. The trawlers go for targets, shrimps, lobsters, what have you. Any other fish is a bycatch. And they used to throw them away because it was illegal. But they found out that in Ghana or other West African countries, people cannot meet, make ends meet when it comes to protein needs. So, they give, I don't know how it happened, but they gave some license to other people to go and buy this bycatch. And then now the thing moved into different level. It is no more a bycatch, but people go in for the juvenile, as you rightly said, and then or catch a fishes that you're not supposed to catch, and they catch and they sell because people have been given some form of uh, permission to go and bring these bycatches. It is no more allowed. And then now, bycatch or the transshipment or what you call the cycle, if you are caught, the law will deal with you. And so the laws are there. <laughs> but interestingly, uh, no, you don't see the, the cake or the tablet uh, bycatch that they call cycle in our landing sites now, because when they see, they will catch. But you still see certain organisms that they are not supposed to catch when you go, they have landed, for instance, I can give you an example. Uh, there's a community called Disco in the Western region. If you go there right now, they are cutting or they have caught uh, dolphins and they are cutting. You know what? Dolphins are protected animals. You are not supposed to cut. So I must say that it's not only just the juveniles, but then there are other organizations that you are not supposed to cut. They are cutting. But that is where the enforcement comes in. The government, uh, the governance system comes in. So I'm a, I am advocating for co-management. The co manager we have a policy, but we are not implementing it. We have to enforce it. So we haven't lose, uh, lost the grip or the control totally, 
but there are some lazity. We have to tighten certain uh, ends so that it will be very effective. Okay, thank you, Professor Agrafin, on that. Um, there's a question from Professor Dominique Marshall, and I think that that relates to the role of academics in, 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 in the sector. She's asking, to what extent is the knowledge you are gathering in your studies? about the links between these practices and conservation, informing environment advocacy or policy. All right, so thank you very much. From time to time, we send policy briefs to the ministry because ministry, uh, the ministry is in charge of uh, monitoring and uh, what do you call it, uh, control, monitoring and surveillance. So these policies, sometimes they factor into the uh, uh, activities. Sometimes to, they have their own line they are towing. So of course, uh, they are politicians. So uh, it becomes difficult to see them implementing everything. But then there are a lot of NGOs that we work with. They do advocacy. They go to the community to educate the, the community. They run workshops to let them know that certain practices will not lead them anywhere. For instance, if your whole cultural lifestyle depends on fishing, then you are only catching the juveniles. And it tells you that the next 5, 10, 20 years, your children may not have the resource to depend on. And, and your culture will die out and your beliefs will also die out. So I think uh, they are understanding. Recently, there have been some FAO programs that uh, try to explain to the fish, various fishing groups. They bring the key stakeholders like the chief fisherman, the Konkonyima, those I mentioned, they try to educate them, then they expect that they will also go and educate their community. So some form of work is being, all these things, academics are involved. I am involved in most of these uh, advocacy group and also training program. And uh, it's happened. It's just that modernity has also brought its own challenges, yes. All right, thank you. There's another question from, Paulina, who says you were her former supervisor. She's asking, um, despite the major role played by the small scale fisheries in Ghana, the communities are still impoverished. Stocks have plummeted and yet little is being done by the government. What can actually be done to help improve the small scale fishery sector and to ensure the sustainability of fish resources in the Ghanaian industry? Yeah, thank you, Paulina. Nice to hear that you are online. Yeah, so, yes, our fishing communities, when you go, you see poverty. Poverty because of certain social cultural practices. If your income level is that low and you want to practice polygamy, you have many wives and many children, of course, then it will be difficult for you to uh, take care of your own life. But, also, government has to uh, step up its support to some of these communities. I must say that it is very difficult to deal with these uh, traditional fishermen. They, as I said, when you are sorry, so when you understand when something is culture and uh, it is imbibed in you, changing the status quo is difficult. Some time ago, the project there's a project we ran and we wanted to train some of the fishing communities how they can undertake small, what they call it, alternative livelihood or supplementary livelihood so that where the fish production is going down or we are not in the bumper harvest, you can go into grass cutter farming, snail farming, mushroom farming. We do believe that most of them clearly indicated that they are not interested in that. They cannot be a snail farmer. They were born to be capture fishermen. Look at this. So in that case, Poverty will persist, but I am of the belief that you are captured fisherman, fine. We are not taking you off your business, but then, or off your traditional culture, but then you can undertake some form of supplementary livelihood that will better your life. And so with this, we can push. In fact, there are other NGOs on the field uh, trying to encourage them to do some of these things, uh, honey or bee uh, harvest, uh, that is uh, production of honey, grass cutter, and so on, and we're farming. But then others are trying to pick up, but most of them, they are not interested in that because they were born to be capture fishermen. So that is the line of poverty. Uh, other than that, uh, I think they can better their life. 
through these things now. All right, um, a question from my side to you, Prof. Um, I'm asking from your research trips across the various geographies you visited, particularly along the coast of West Africa, are there any helpful you know, artisanal fishing practices that you believe you've seen common to the various geographies that you visited? And were these carried over or were these carried over or, or transferred by uh, migrating fishermen? Uh, how did it become an endemic practice along the, the stretch of the coastline, the coastal line that you, you investigate? And then my second question is, what would you say is the impact of climate change on the fisheries sector in Ghana? Would you say it is mainly the impact mainly tilts towards the depletion of stock in our water bodies or it is the extinction of some important, you know, uh, varieties of fishes in our, in our in our water bodies. What would you say is mainly the the biggest impact of climate change on all of these? All right, thank you very much. So I'll answer the first one, then I'll continue. The yeah. So the first one is see, these fishermen because they move transnationally along the coast of West Africa, they also carry their ideas and techniques along, and they also learn from others in other countries. For instance, Ghana, we used not to have what you call the Tenge net, the big person net, which is so huge that when it is set, it can clear so many small pelagics. We used not to do, uh, uh, have that in our waters. But um, I understand that historically, it was being practiced in some of the Francophone countries. And then probably as they move, to these countries and fish, and they also returned to Ghana. They brought these ideas, and now we also have them in our water. Uh, formerly, they use basic, just as it's happening in our small scale mining, they use uh, traditional and basic uh, gadgets or equipment to fish. And so the stocks were uh, in their high form, but then now, because of all these. Uh, modern technique, they have modified the gears. For instance, some of the gears I have seen on the field, they have lined the, the, the bag that will take the fish, what you call the, uh, the basin, the one that they pull, they have lined it with very fine mesh, which is against the law. And if you don't get close to the gear and their practice, you wouldn't see. And so it tends to catch the smallest juvenile that could grow and go back and replenish the soil. So it's a problem. So that probably answered the first one. Again, on the climate change, there has been indications in our waters since long that our waters are getting warmer. For instance, there is a fish called Erefua. English name, Erefua is the fancy name. The English name is trigger fish or great trigger fish. It's a reef fish. The scientific name is Ballistis capriscus. I studied a lot on this fish for my PhD, and uh, it shows clearly that this fish was abundant in West African water, that is the Gulf of Guinea and Ghana, way back in, in the 70s and early 80s. As at 1987, we recorded about 500 thousand metric tons of this fish. So people invested in this fishery, a river fishery or the trigger fish fishery. Then by the twinkling of an eye, this fish collapsed or it vanished. And if a fishery is collapsing, it doesn't collapse within a year. The stocks dwindle from time to time, then it vanishes. This one vanishes all of a sudden. So I set out to understand what is the cause of this fish that was in abundance in our waters and it vanished? It came out that our waters had been very warm from the environmental data that I analyzed. Our waters have been very warm. And this fish being a reef fish and also a fish that can move around, they have moved out of our waters. And there are records to show that. And recently we have also discovered deep water coral reefs. Mostly the coral reefs are at the surface. But because the waters are warm, our, deep, our coral reefs are deep, about 400 meters deep. And these reef fishes are there. And they are also across the Florida, uh, that is uh, Atlantic coast 
in the Florida direction. And therefore, the conclusion was that probably the climate change and its uh, warm conditions in the tropical waters have started having effect on some fishes to run away. You know, the fishes don't need passport to cross the Atlantic, unlike me and you. You have to take a passport to cross. So they might have moved to a comfortable place because it has been re recorded that Florida and other west coast of Atlantic, they have been uh, catching some of these uh, fish. So as I said, trigger fish is just a typical example. There might be other fishes that we have been studied. All right. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph Agrafe. That's it's, it's quite uh, an engaging interaction with you on the topic that you chose to present on today. Personally, I must say I'm intrigued on the element of modernity and how it impacts the entire industry that you mentioned. But I'm sure we can't we can't continue because of uh, time. And so probably we can engage more subsequently after the, the talk is ended. Um, Unfortunately, we'd have to bring a close to the presentation today. And so I'll give you the opportunity to, to, to give us your concluding remarks. If there is anything um, of particular importance that you want to drive home or talk about, the general line of your you know, further research is in, in the area. You have the opportunity, probably 30 seconds maximum, to right, just so give us your Thank you very remarks. much. Yeah, so as I said, small scale fishery is a very important fish area that we need to pay attention to that. Uh, if you go close to them in their communities, there are challenges, as you have alluded to that. Uh, poverty level is high, and then uh, some social cultural issues that we have to support them so that they can uh, uh, increase their production. Increasing production doesn't mean that they are going to deplete the stock. There are so many ways to increase the production. Government can go in to set up what they call fish sanctuaries so that they can go there to fish. With that, we can also support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joseph Agrippin, for that wonderful lecture you've given us today. Um, we are just about rounding up the talk for the day. But before we sign off, permit me to um, say a special thank you to um, a figure that has been behind the scenes contributing so much to the organization of the series. And it's none other than Professor Dominic Marshall, who happens to be the chair of the Shannon Endowment Fund. Um, she's been indeed instrumental and wonderful in the organization of the series. We say, uh, God richly bless her. And so our next talk in the series comes off on the 24th of June. And this is going to be given by Professor Shirin Hassim. Um, shortly we have, yes, that is a, a flyer of the presentation up there on our screens. Um, she's talking about grass in the cracks, gender, social reproduction, and climate justice in the Zolobeni struggle. I think the setting of this presentation is in South Africa. Uh, Professor Shirin Asim is also an academic lecturer at the Carlton University. And so we would want to throw a special invitation to all of you who were able to make time to attend today's presentation. On the 24th of June, we call on you to um, attend this lecture again and then make it a success. And on that note, we thank you all once again, Professor Joseph Agrafin, Professor uh, uh, Dominic Marshall, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you.